So first of all, I want to thank um, Dr. Horowitz and Dr. Devlin for inviting me here to speak with all of you today, and thank you all for coming to my talk to listen to me talk for the next 30 or 40 minutes or so. Um, so this paper is the result of a collaboration between myself and Dr. Grace Sullivan Bucher. Uh, the two of us, when we wrote this piece uh, and published it earlier this year. We were both PhD students. I was studying criminal justice at American University, and she was studying linguistics at Georgetown University. And the two of us were drawn together by our mutual interest in the field of forensic linguistics, which is the field that examines the intersection of language and the law. And so what I'm going to be doing for you today is talking about the ways in which ideas and methods from the field of linguistics can be applied to a very important issue in criminal criminal justice today, and that is police-citizen interactions, specifically interactions with minority uh, citizens. So the history of race and policing goes way back, and in a short talk like today's, I don't have time to do the subject justice, but where I'm going to take up that history is in uh, the year 2013, with the death of a 17-year-old African-American named Trayvon Martin. He was shot and killed in his central Florida neighborhood uh, by another resident of that neighborhood named George Zimmerman. And in the wake of his death and the acquittal of George Zimmerman for any criminal responsibility in his death, there is widespread uh, disappointment and anger directed toward the criminal justice system in the United States. And this is compounded by the deaths of a number of other other unarmed African American citizens in the months and the years that followed, uh, including Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, Tamir Rice in Cleveland, Ohio, as well as um, right here in New York City, Eric Garner in Staten Island. And what all of these stories have in common is that they were unarmed African American men who um, died as a result of excessive police use of force. And uh, together, these stories had a way of unifying people due to the um, vast amounts of anger, fear, disappointment, injustice that they exhibited. And together, um, they brought people together in the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which is unified around countering racial profiling, racial bias, bias in the criminal justice system, specifically on the part of police. Uh, and in the years since then, so from 2013 to now, there's uh, one other story that also got um, quite a bit of attention due to many of the same themes um, that were evident in that case, um, although it received a little bit less attention than the ones that I've already mentioned. And this is the story of Sandra Bland. So Sandra Bland was a 28-year-old African-American woman. In the summer of 2015, she moved to Prairie View, Texas to take a job at a local college. And she was driving down one of the main roads one day um, in July of 2015 when she changed lanes without signaling. So she failed to signal the lane change. Uh, and she was pulled over by a Texas state trooper named Officer Brian Insinia. And the traffic stop escalated dramatically from just the initial interaction that they had. It escalated in a very, very dramatic, disproportionate way. Um, and so this event is also seen as being uh, an example of excessive police use of force. And she ended up um, being arrested and jailed for this interaction. Now, what sets this interaction apart from many of the other stories that I mentioned is that the entire interaction in this case was captured on video. So it was captured by the dash camera uh, on the officer's vehicle. So from the beginning of the interaction to the end, we have everything on camera. And this struck us, uh, myself and Dr. Bucher, as a very unique opportunity to be able to examine exactly what went wrong in this case. So we have everything from beginning to end, including the escalation, everything that preceded it, and everything that came after. And we wanted to see what is there in this escalation that we could learn based off of just how uh, these two were speaking. So I'm going to pause here for a minute. I'm going to show you the portion of the interaction that we were analyzing that I'm going to get into in the second half of the talk. So um, I'll show you just about five minutes or so of it. Um, what you're going to see is the video, the portion of the video that I'm going to show starts with Officer Insinia in his vehicle. So he's gotten the kind of documentation that he needs from Sandra Bland. He's decided that he's going to give her a warning. And so you'll see him approach her vehicle. Um, they're going to interact. The interaction is going to escalate, like I said, very dramatically. So 
you're going to hear quite a bit of shouting. There's going to be um, quite a bit of profanity as well. And then at one point, they're going to move off to the side, but you'll still be able to hear what they're saying, even though you can't directly see them. So I'm going to pause for a minute. Okay, ma'am. You okay? I'm waiting on you. You. This is your job. I'm waiting on you. What do you want me to do? Oh, you seem very irritated. I am. I, I really am. I feel like this crap is what I'm getting the ticket for. I was getting out of your way. You were speeding up, tailing me. So I move over and you stop me. So, yeah, I am a little irritated, but that doesn't stop you from giving me a ticket. So. Are you done? You asked me what was wrong, and I told you. Okay. So now I'm done, yeah. Okay. You mind putting out your cigarette, please? Don't oh, mind. I'm in my car, but I have to put out my cigarette. Well, you can step on out now. I don't have to step out of my car. Step out of the car. Step no, out of the car. Have, no, you don't have the right. Step you not, out of the car. You do not have the right to do that. I do have the right. Now step out or I will say, remove you. I refuse to talk to you other than to identify myself. Step and out or I will I, remove you. I am getting removed for a failure. Step to out or I will remove you. I'm giving you a lawful order. Get out of the car now or I'm, I'm going to remove you. And I'm calling my I'm going to yank you out of here. Okay, you're going to yank me out of my car? Get out. Okay. All right. 25. Let's, let's do this. Yeah, we're going to. Yeah. Don't, don't touch me. Get don't out of the car. Me. Don't touch me. I'm not under arrest. You don't have the right to take you me. You are under car. arrest. I'm under arrest for what? 25. For what? 7 County FM 1098. Just for what? 290. Send me another unit. Get out of the car. Get out of the car now. Why am I being apprehended? You're trying to give me a ticket I said for your get failure? out of the car. Why am I being apprehended? You I'm giving you a lawful order. order. You I'm going to drag you out of here. So you're going you're going to drag me out of my own car. Get out of the car. And then you I will light me? you up. Get out. Wow. Now. Wow. Get out of the car. Really for a failure to signal. You're doing all of this for Get a over to there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, let's take this to court. Let's do Go it. ahead. For a failure to signal. Yep. For a failure to signal. Get off the phone. On my school. Get off the phone. I'm not on the phone. I have a right Put to record. Put your phone down. Property. Put your phone property. down. Sir? Put your phone down. Right now. Put your phone down. For a fucking failure to signal, my goodness. Come over here. Y'all are interested. Come over here now. You, you feeling good about yourself? Stand right here. You feeling good about yourself? Stand right there. For a failure to signal, you feel, right you feel real good Turn about around. yourself, don't you? Turn around. You feel good about yourself, don't you? Turn around now. What, what are you, Put your hands behind your back and turn around. Turn around. Why can you tell me I'm why giving I'm, you a law for order. I will tell you. Why am I being arrested? Turn why around. Why won't you tell me that part? I'm giving you a law for order. Turn around. Why will you not tell you me what's going on? You are not complying. I'm not complying because you just pulled me out of my car. Turn around. Are you fucking kidding me? This is some bullshit. Put your hands you know behind your back. Because you know this is straight bullshit and you full of shit. Full of straight shit. That's all y'all is. It's some scary fucking cops. South Carolina got y'all bitch asses scared. That's all it is. Fucking scared of a female. If you would have just what listened. I was trying to sign the fucking ticket. Whatever. Stop moving. Are you fucking serious? Stop you? moving. Oh, I can't wait till we go to court. Oh, I can't wait. I cannot wait till we go to court. I can't wait. Oh, I can't wait. You want me to sit down now? No. Or are you going to gonna throw me to the floor? That'll make you feel bad about yourself? Knock it off. No, nah, that'll make you feel bad about yourself? That'll make you feel real good, won't it? Pussy ass. Fucking pussy. For a failure to signal, you're doing all of this. A little ass prayer review Texas. My God, they they must want to. You were getting a warning until you. now. You're going to jail. No, I'm getting a, for what? You can come for read. What? Come read right. I'm getting a warning for what? Stay right here. For what? Will stay you just right pointing here. me over there? I said stay right Get here. Get your fucking mind right. Let me. Oh, I swear on my life, y'all some pussies. A pussy ass cop for a fucking signal. You gonna take me to jail? She's in handcuffs. What a pussy. What a pussy. What a pussy. You about to break my fucking wrist. Stop moving. I'm standing still. You Stay keep right moving here. me, god damn it. Stay right there. Don't touch me. Fucking pussy for a traffic ticket. Come right right over here. This right here says a warning. You started creating the problems. You asked me what was wrong. Do you have I'm trying to tell you. Person that's do, illegal? do it feel like I got anything on me? This is a fucking maxi your, dress. Remove your glasses. All right. So that gives you some idea of 
how the interaction went, went about. Uh, after that portion of the video ends, uh, what you see is Sandra Bland gets arrested for assaulting a public servant. Uh, she was held in jail on bail, but she was unable to pay her bail. Um, and so several days later, she was found uh, dead in her cell. She committed suicide by hanging in her cell. Uh, and so this is a really, really tragic story that in a lot of way, ways um, exemplifies a lot of the issues that our criminal justice system deals with today. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention before about her background is that she had been stopped 10 times in the previous several years for a lot of minor driving infractions. And she owed thousands of dollars in fees and fines. Um, and this is similar to the experience that many other African-American drivers face today, this over-policing. Um, and this might have had something to do with the way that she approached the interaction and the way that she chose to speak to Officer Insinia. Uh, and then Officer Insinia himself is the product of a police culture that most researchers agree is either explicitly or implicitly biased against African-American drivers. Uh, and this might have had something to do with the way that he approached the interaction and the way that he spoke and he responded to Sandra Bland. But what we were interested in because of our background in linguistics was just the language. If we forget everything else, let's pretend we don't know anything about their background. What can we tell about what happened and what went wrong in this interaction just based off of the language that the two of them chose to use? So that brings me to the two questions that I'm going to address uh, in today's talk. The first is, um, what does the language is in this interaction tell us about what went wrong? Like I said, if we just forget everything else and we only look at the transcript, what is it in the language that can tell us what happened? Uh, and then secondly, what does this teach us about policing? So is there some kind of a bigger message that we can take away from this interaction and apply um, to policing culture or to police training? So those are the two questions that I'm going to be uh, addressing in today's talk. Uh, to be able to answer these questions, I want to give you a little bit of background on a couple of important concepts that you need to understand before we get into the answers to these questions. Uh, and the first is forensic linguistics. So this is the approach that we were taking in our analysis, is the approach of the intersection between language and the law, and the way that these kind, this knowledge of language can be applied to understanding the issue in this video. Uh, so this definition, um, the intersection of language and the law can sound a little bit narrow, uh, like it's a very narrow field, but actually there's a lot of things that fall under this umbrella term. So forensic linguists do all sorts of things. They analyze language evidence, so the type of evidence like ransom notes, suicide notes, threatening voicemails or threatening uh, emails, and the way that those are used in court. Um, they analyze legal documents like contracts and court decisions and also um, trademark disputes, all sorts of things. In our research, the way we were using it was by applying the uh, methods, the ideas, the theories from the field of linguistics to this issue in the criminal justice system, which is police-citizen interactions. And this is actually a very fruitful area of research within forensic linguistics um, because a lot of people don't realize that upwards of 90% of what police do on a day-to-day -day basis is communicate with people. Less than 10% of an officer's daily duties include the physical aspects of the job. So chasing people down or tackling suspects or taking them into custody. By far the majority of what they do is actually based in their language and in the communication practices. Um, so this area of research includes all sorts of things like police interrogations, the best ways to elicit a confession from a suspect and the ways that probably you shouldn't do it. Uh, the Miranda warning, so this is um, the classic uh, you have the right to remain silent. That's the Miranda warning, the way that it's delivered by um, interrogators or, or in questioning, the way that it's understood by suspects. Um, and then also false confessions, how we can identify false confessions from true confessions, and what kind of interrogation tactics are most likely to elicit false confessions. Uh, and then finally, this very small area within this uh, field, which is what Dr. Bucher and I were analyzing here, which is these everyday interactions, the way that cops talk to people on an everyday basis and the way that these communication um, practices can increase uh, trust and confidence in law enforcement. So that's what we are examining here. There's one other issue, um, one other concept, and this is, comes from criminal justice that I want to introduce here up front, uh, and that's the idea of legitimacy. So this is a concept that comes from originally from political science, um, and it's been adopted into criminal justice, and it explains the way that police officers are viewed by the citizens as either having or as lacking the right to claim power over them and what they do 
uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So police have this power. They have the right that is given to them by the government to be able to take us to jail, make us pay a fine, um, arrest, uh, get, pay a ticket, go to court, all sorts of things that police can tell us what to do. And they're given this power by the state. But whether or not we as citizens actually view the police as having this right and as having this power is a totally different issue. So you can think yourselves about the last time that you interacted with a police officer and think about whether or not you viewed that officer as having legitimacy, the right to claim power over you, the right to direct your actions. And so that's legitimacy. And the reason I want to introduce it up front is because in the rest of the analysis that I'm going to get into uh, in the language part, what we came back to again and again in our conclusions is that the problem in this interaction comes down to this question of legitimacy, whether or not Officer Insignia had the legitimacy to tell Sandra Bland what to do, and whether or not she understood him as having that kind of legitimacy, and how he himself understood his own legitimacy. So this is the key concept that everything keeps coming back to. So that's why I wanted to uh, put it up, up front. But to get into the actual analysis, these are the three language structures that we analyzed in our paper. So they are questions and answers, requests and commands, and jargon, which means specialized terms. These are usually terms that are specialized for a certain job or occupation. So these are the three language structures that we analyzed. I'm going to dive right in with the first one. So uh, this is an example of a question answer sequence that uh, took place in the stop. So Sandra Bland says, when are you going to let me go? And Insinia says, I don't know. Bland says, why will you not let me, or not tell me what's going on? And Insinia says, you're not complying. And so interestingly enough, these, I, I picked these because these are the only two direct answers that Insinia gives to the many, many questions that Sandra Bland used in the interaction. Uh, you, you, you know, think back to the video and think about all these questions that she's asking him. These are the only two that he answered in any sense of the word. Um, and even these two answers are not really what we would call like satisfying answers or really full answers. Um, so this, this stood out to us as being fairly unusual. So what we did is we looked at the numbers behind this. Um, we compiled here the number of questions that were being asked by Sandra Bland, the number of questions that were being asked by Officer Insinia, and how many of those questions got answered. And what immediately jumps out is the number of questions that Sandra Bland was asking. She asked over half the questions in the interaction. And this is super unusual for a police citizen encounter, and any encounter where there's a power difference between the two speakers. Because usually questions are one of those ways that people show that they have dominance in an interaction. So questions reveal that that they, the person who's asking the question has the power to direct the conversation. So it's really unusual that in this interaction, it was the citizen who was asking all of the questions. So that struck us as unusual. And the second part of that in the answer column, you can see that only two of her answers, the two that I showed you on the previous slide, only two of her answers, or her questions were actually answered by Officer Insinia. So there's two reasons why this is interesting. The first is that um, the, of the, the many questions that Sandra Bland asks in the interaction show that she was questioning Officer Insinia's legitimacy, his right to be able to direct her actions and to tell her what to do. So she's asking all of these questions. She's showing by not paying attention to the normal rules of the conversation, which is that she's not allowed to ask questions because she's the one without power. So she's not paying attention to those normal rules of conversation. She's taking it upon herself to ask these questions. And she's doing so in an attempt to get some kind of justification or explanation for why he's taking these steps in the traffic stop that she seems to understand is very unusual sequence of events. So she's asking all these questions, trying to get some kind of a justification or explanation. Um, and then to go to the other column on the other side, what we, sh what we see is that Officer Insinia is not answering these questions. He's choosing not to answer them. Uh, and so what we think is going on here is that Officer Insinia is showing that he has power in the interaction by not answering her questions. Um, because he is showing that he is the one who has the power to direct the direction of the conversation. That he will answer the questions that he wants to answer and he won't answer the ones that he doesn't. And so he is uh, the one answering the question, or he was the one directing the conversation. And so this is one of the ways that he is showing through his language choices that he has power in the interaction. He's trying to maintain power. Um, uh, interestingly enough, and he answered her questions or maybe addressed her concerns, the interaction wouldn't have devolved in the way that it did. So one of his um, you know, language strategies in trying to keep power is actually one of the things that ended up contributing to the situation devolving. 
Moving on to another language form, requests and commands. What I'm going to show you up here is just Officer Insinia's side of the conversation. So you're going to see quotes from how he formulates his requests and commands over the course of the interaction. So you're going to see that this changes with each successive request or command that he gives for almost, almost the same thing. The, the first one is a little bit different, but after that, he's asking for the same action from her, which is to exit her vehicle. So. The first request that he gives is, you mind putting out your cigarette, please, if you don't mind. So he's asking her to put out her cigarette. What you'll notice here in this uh, formulation of this request is that this is uh, done as a question. So it's not done as a direct order. He formulates this as a question. And in linguistics, questions are uh, one of the ways that people signal a request in a way that's like a little bit less threatening than a direct command. You phrase it as a question, it's considered to be a little bit more polite. I hesitate in this uh, circumstance to say that he was being polite because it's pretty obvious by his tone that he didn't mean to be polite. But at least on the linguistic level, what we see is a way of requesting her action that's a little bit less threatening than what comes after. Because the next thing he asks for when she refuses is he says, well, you can step on out now. So now we no longer have a question construction. Now we have a direct sort of this direct sentence uh, but it still has a couple of informal features in the language so this beginning it with well so well you can step on out now that's kind of this informal feature in his language um, step on out is more informal than what comes next which is step out of the car so he loses those informal features of his language the well and the step on out um, and again, he's changing. So no longer are we in this question construction, um, this questioning way of asking her to do something. Now we're in this very direct sort of imperative uh, statement. When she still refuses to exit the vehicle, he moves on and he changes his request. He says, step out or I will remove you. So again, we have this statement, but it is with what we would call like this coercive element. It's with this extra added, here's what I'm going to do if you don't comply with my orders. Uh, and then finally, we have, I'm going to yank you out of here. So again, we have this escalation in the language. So we've, we're a far way away from this question construction that we started out with. In each successive step, what you're seeing is that there is this successive escalation in the language in the way that he's asking her to complete these requests. And again, showing his power in the interaction. Um, and interestingly, I want to point out one other feature. So there's a difference in the last two steps between the word remove and yank you out. So he starts out with this sort of remove, which is, a, which is a formal term, and yank, which is informal. And this is consistent with a lot of research, which has found that officers in interactions where they're getting really emotional and out of control, they start to use less formal language sort of toward the end there. So that's consistent with some other research as well. So what I want to point out here again, before I move on to the next, uh, the next slide, is that there is this successive escalation in the language, that just looking at his language, you can tell what's going on in the interaction. You can tell that he's trying hard, very hard to maintain control because the way, that, the way that he's formulating these requests changes as she's refusing to comply with his orders. Moving on to the third linguistic form, this is jargon. So you'll remember that these are specialized terms. Um, there were two uh, pieces of jargon that really jumped out to us in this interaction. The first is failure to signal, and the other is um, lawful order. So these two terms, they stood out to us. They seemed to us as being sort of these like weird law enforcement terms that were being used. Um, and what we did is we searched for these terms in what's called the Corpus of Contemporary American English. And this is a uh, a database of all this compiled language in English. And when you search for a word there, you can see how often it comes up in contemporary usage, what the context is, and how it's used, and who it's used by. So we searched for these two words. And what we found was that in both cases, um, these words are rarely used outside of law enforcement. They are almost exclusively law enforcement terms. Um, Interestingly, though, one of these is used by Sandra Bland. So failure to signal is a word that is a term in the interaction that Sandra Bland uses. She adopts. It's a law enforcement term. It, it only refers to uh, law enforcement situations. She's using this in the interaction in a number of times in a number of different ways. But lawful order is used uh, by Insinia. So we wanted to look at uh, the context of these and, and what purpose they were being used for. 
So what we found is, I'm going to show you examples in the next couple slides of this, so it'll be a little more clear. But just to preview what I'm going to be showing you examples of, we found that um, by using the word failure to signal, this term failure to signal, Sandra Bland shows that she has some kind of a knowledge of the legal system, that she's savvy, that she understands what's going on, she understands that it's unusual, and he can't so easily take advantage of her. Um, and the other is that, again, as with her questions, she's asking for some kind of justification. She's signaling that she knows that this is an unusual stop and that there should be some kind of better explanation that she's getting. On the other side, on lawful order, what we found is that Insinia was using the term lawful order as an answer in itself, as justification in and of itself, that that should be enough, the lawful order, that he was a representative of the government, and that that in itself is enough to make her comply. Uh, and again, it's part of this attempt to gain compliance through his power as a representative of the state. So I'm going to show you some examples of these. So I know this is a lot of text, sorry about that. But I have in, uh, highlighted in red the failure to signal terms when she uses it. Uh, and what you'll notice is that she's using this term sort of in this ironic way as combined with questions. Uh, she's using it. Um, in combination with other references to the legal system. So she says, yeah, let's take this to court. She references other aspects of the legal system throughout the interaction as well. I'm going to call my lawyer. Um, you don't have the right to do this. I can't wait to take this to court. All sorts of other references that she makes that show that she has knowledge of the legal system and she knows that what he's doing is not legitimate, that he doesn't have the right to direct her actions in this way. So through the use of this term, especially combined with the questions, this is one of the ways that she shows that she knows that he's not a legitimate authority, and so she doesn't have to comply with his orders. For some examples for lawful order here, uh, again, the term is highlighted in, in uh, red. And what you'll notice is that it's given in response to a question of hers. She asks a question, and really the only response that he, substantive response that he gives is, I'm giving you a lawful order. This is a little more clear in the second example. She says, why am I being apprehended? You just opened my, and he says, I'm giving you a lawful order. So this is the only kind of answer that she gets to her question, her, her request for justification. Uh, and so this is uh, a way in which he's showing, Officer Insinia is showing that he has the power of the state behind him uh, and that that should be enough to get her to comply. Uh, and, and, and I also want to point out that Sandra Bland is giving him multiple openings to be able to explain his legitimacy and his justification. Um, and he's choosing not to take any of them. Instead, he's choosing to just use this term lawful order to highlight the fact that he's a state representative and that he uh, is able to do this lawfully. Okay, so that's a lot of language analysis. Where does all of this get us? What, what is it that we can take away from this and maybe learn about um, the interaction and what went wrong? Well, what we concluded in our analysis is that essentially the problem in the interaction came down to a disconnect in legitimacy. That Sandra Bland understood Officer Insignia's legitimacy in a different way than he did. And you can see this through the way that she uses her questions, through the way that she harnesses this term lawful order. She takes it into her own language, out of law enforcement language, into her own. And through her language choices, you can see that she questions his legitimacy. She questions his right to be able to direct her actions. And then on the other side, we have Officer Insinia, who not only does he not give her the kind of justification or the kind of explanation that she's looking for, he's relying simply upon his role as a law enforcement officer and his power in that role to make her comply. Um, so he's not giving this kind of really strong justification that she needs, and he's just relying upon uh, his power. So it's this disconnect in legitimacy that we concluded is at the heart of the way that this interaction devolved um, in such a, in ultimately such a tragic way. Uh, to return to the second question that I posed at the beginning, um, what can we learn about this interaction? What can it teach us about policing as a whole? Is there something else that we can take away from this? Um, our research, along with a lot of other research that's been published recently, encourages not only a community policing aspect, um, but specifically what we call procedural justice. And so this is a term that references that officers and their individual everyday interactions with citizens can help promote trust and confidence in law enforcement as a whole. When these interactions are fair, when they're respectful, and when they address citizen questions and concerns. And when these interactions are done in a fair way, officers can help promote um, 
compliance with the law, compliance with police directives. They can help ensure that people will call the police for help, that people will help find suspects, that all of these sort of um, public safety outcomes are improved just through the use of these individual fair interactions. So our research, other researchers, and a lot of police leaders across the country today are advocating for more of this interactional aspect of police training. Because um, it's through these individual interactions that police can help rebuild some of the trust and legitimacy um, that they've recently lost in the community. Uh, and then finally, it's my hope that this talk has helped open your eyes to the ways in which the language that we choose says something about us. And that language isn't just a reflection of the world or what's going on, that in a way it's a reflection of ourselves and who we are and what our motivations are, what our beliefs are. Are. Uh, and that this kind of knowledge of language and this type of linguistic analysis can help us understand not just police citizen interactions, but all sorts of social issues uh, today. So I'm happy to take your questions. Um, if you want to read a copy of the original paper, I'm very happy to send it to you. I will warn you, it's a little more theoretical and methodologically dense than today's talk, but I'm happy to share that as well. So, your questions? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. So for those of you that can't hear in the back, the question is, um, how could this interaction have gone better um, considering their backgrounds? Um, and that um, you make a really good point, which is that she had switched lanes because he was behind her. And she, she mentions this at some point as well. Um, so, so yeah, absolutely. That's one of the reasons that this whole interaction got started in the first place was because she was moving. And that's, that sort of speaks to some larger issues within policing, right? Um, as far as how the interaction could have gone better, um, one of the things that we're learning from a lot of research in policing today is that it's really, really important for officers to answer citizens' questions, to address their concerns, um, and to create an environment where citizens feel like they can ask these questions without getting some kind of repercussions. So um, it's important to, first of all, from the big picture, uh, stance to be able to create this kind of law enforcement culture. Um, in this interaction specifically, I mean, one of the really solid things that he could have done was address her questions, um, sort of mitigate this in, in the way that she wouldn't feel like he was simply taking advantage of her in like this biased kind of way, which is obviously what she thought. Um, so by answering her questions, he could have helped her feel like the interaction was more fair, less biased. Um, so that's one of the concrete things that he could have done. Um, so is there a similar thought in the back there that there, she bears some responsibility? This is something that I hear a lot, yeah. I think that you can think about it um, as, and, and of course in every interaction, everyone bears some kind of responsibility for the way that an interaction goes down, because there's two speakers in every interaction, at least two, right? Um, I think that one useful way to think about this might be, again, about the power dynamic um, and the way that he, because he has so much more power in the interaction, he has a higher burden to, um, make the interaction go in a safe direction. Because as a citizen, I mean, she's the one who was being stopped. She's the one who was being sanctioned. Um, and so as a law enforcement officer, he has, a, a, I, I think, th there wasn't anything unsafe going on in the interaction. That's something that mostly everyone agrees on. Um, some people mentioned the cigarette as being part of the safety issue, but I don't think that anyone really I don't know if anyone takes that seriously as being a safety issue. So I think that he had a higher burden to, to maintain the um, tone of the interaction and the safety of it. Um, so yeah there's, yeah, there's quite a bit of debate as to the circumstances surrounding her death. Right, yeah. So one of the things, there's a really great article that I totally recommend, which is by Debbie Nathan, who came and spoke here, uh, I think last month or a couple months ago. Um, she did a really, really great piece on the background, or Sandra Bland's background and her mental health specifically. Um, and so it seems that, yeah, she had a, a history of mental health problems, of depression. Um, she had a really, really hard life. And I, I definitely recommend the article because it sets the stage sort of for what happened. So I think a lot of people who have a hard time understanding how that can happen, um, it speaks to the issue of, of depression and how seriously it should be taken. Yeah, if she had put out the cigarette, what would have happened? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's really hard to speculate, right? I mean, there's some argument for if she had just complied with that first action that she could have cut off the whole thing from the beginning. Um, I think, you know, some of some of the way that the rest of it progressed shows that both of them were very intent on their points of view um, and, and the way that they were going about the interaction, you know, maybe some of the preconceived ideas that they had brought to the interaction. So, yeah, it's really hard, hard to speculate.
Yeah, I, and that's a totally valid perspective. I understand that how you could interpret it that way. Um, there's a couple things that I want to say, which is um, returning to the issue of you know the burden that he has as the one in control and as the representative of the government to keep things professional. That it was, I think, on him. Despite whatever she says, I don't think that there's any kind of justification for that kind of escalation um, outside of some kind of. Um, use of force against him or some kind of threat to his life, which there wasn't. So that's sort of my two cents on that. Um, and, and as well, I think in the larger scope of policing, we don't want an environment where citizens don't feel like they can um, express themselves to officers. So it's not really like a, an environment that we want to promote that you know they can't speak up about their concerns. Um, okay, in the back. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, there have been some studies on this. Uh, so how would this change if there were multiple officers or if there are multiple people in the car? Um, so there, uh, oh, this is going back to like some of my, my PhD reading from years ago. Um, there's, there have been a number of studies that look into how these interactional factors change when there are other people watching. Um, I believe that what they've found, and this is like going way back in my memory, is that officers are more likely to arrest people and to sanction people when there are other officers around, um, either for some kind of like a performance aspect or like they feel some kind of extra pressure or some kind of extra backup. Um, and sort of the same on the on the drive on the passenger side that they feel like um, a little bit of extra power to stand up. You know, it's really hard to know. I myself haven't done any analysis with multiple people in an interaction. So when I did my dissertation research, I did a bunch of analyses of more routine stuff than this from Spokane, Washington, just regular interactions. And I limited it to one person and one interaction. So I haven't done any of that kind of work, and I'm not familiar with any work uh, that looks specifically at that, at the language issue when there are multiple participants. It's a great question, and, and actually direct, speaking directly to that, um, it's one of the benefits of increased um, body cameras, is that we have this kind of data, so that we can actually go in and answer these kinds of questions. It's really yeah, so uh, so if you want to go back and watch the whole video, he did call for backup, um, and uh, one or two officers did end up showing up. Yeah, and, and sort of toward the end, and it's a female officer, and she very strongly takes his side of, of what happened, Yeah, even though she wasn't there. Um, what I want to emphasize with this paper is that uh, actually, and if you read the, actual, the paper itself, we actually don't, we barely talk about the background of the two of them. Um, and the reason for that is because of the method that we were using in, within linguistics is called conversation analysis. So we were, that, and that's a method that requires us to completely ignore everything else that happened, their backgrounds and everything. It's, we, the points that you're bringing up are definitely part of the conversation that I think people should be having about this kind of a stop. Um, and I, I think, but I think that they're a different kind of analysis. Um, and so what I want to emphasize with our paper is that we don't ascribe any kind of blame. We wanted to see only what we can understand from the interaction based off of the language that, that she chose. Yeah, I think that maybe one of the issues is that there's a difference between the words on paper and the way that it was expressed. And so I think what a lot of people ca ca catch on is the emotion in the language. And so people could interpret that maybe as being like not a factual request when really, yeah, it is. She's actually, right, she's specifically asking about what's going on. Yeah, and I think that it is it is important to separate the emotion part out of it. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Yeah, thank you for, for asking. So the question is, um, how would it be different if the uh, gender of the two were reversed, if it was a female cop and a male driver? So I actually haven't done any of this research myself. It's on the list of things that I absolutely want to look at, because I think it's a really interesting dynamic when we're talking about female cops. Yeah, I think it's possible. I think it's possible. There is quite a lot of research on female police officers um, and the way that they, they match up in a lot of respects. Um, but yeah, great question. Thank you. So there's um, been quite a bit of conversation about the legality of the stop and like what happened exactly. So it, for, from what I've read about the issue, and you can you can Google this. Did he, you know, was was he legal with his with he, within his rights? Um, it, it appears that the Supreme Court agrees that that is allowed. It is allowed for her to be asked to step out of her vehicle um, because he had some kind of reasonable suspicion that she had done something illegal, which is switch lanes as. Uh, insignificant as that might seem, that's enough to make it a legal request for him to ask her to exit. Um, of him actually entering her vehicle and pulling her out, that appears to be the part that is um, more questionable legally. Okay, so yeah, so from a linguistic aspect, how do these other cases relate to Sandra Bland's case? Great question, yeah, thank you, Liz. Um, 
<laughs> um, uh, so it's hard to know. And that's one of the reasons that this traffic stop is so interesting to us, because it's one of the few that were recorded uh, from beginning to end. Um, I think Eric Garner's uh, case, part of his stop was recorded. Um, I haven't done a linguistic analysis of that one. But in many of these other cases that we're talking about, it's something that was not recorded. And so it's kind of like a he said, he, she, or he said kind of situation. Um, but with the spread of, of police body cameras, this is one of the things that we'll be able to do hopefully more and more.